This video is sponsored by Aura. Hello, this week I'm traveling, so I thought that I can bring you with me, and while we go, we can speak about how much do international programs really cost. So while doing research for the series about Eurofighter, I stumbled upon a scientific paper and this paper was analyzing the complex supply chains that are required to build and maintain modern combat aircraft and they were using the Eurofighter as a paradigm. This video won't be about the Eurofighter, it won't be about what they actually have discovered about the supply chains of international and cooperative programs that frankly was unexpected. Well, first things first, let's clarify what is a logistic chain in an industrial context because I'm sure many of you are familiar with logistics in a military context but in an industrial context a logistic chain is the sum of all the suppliers entities that are involved in the delivery of a final product and typically you have an entity a company at the top that so for example for the F-35 is Lockheed Martin for the Eurofighter is Netma these have suppliers these don't do everything still down to the last screw down to the last rivet because they obviously have suppliers and the supply chain for a fighter is basically enormous and the kind of supply chain that you choose to build your aircraft may have interesting implications but before moving on i would like you to hear a personal story related to this video sponsor, Aura. As you know, I'm Italian, but I live most of the time in the United Kingdom. However, I travel four or five times a year to Italy. Once, while I was in Italy, I received on my phone the notification that I had ordered Indian food from a restaurant in London. Well, my first reaction was that as an Italian, it was impossible for me to order Indian food. Then I suddenly realized that someone was using my food delivery account without my permission. I was later informed that my password had been sold online. This is the reason why when Aura reached out for this sponsorship, I was genuinely happy. Aura provides you with simple online safety for the whole family, taking care of these lesser known but crucial aspects of your digital security. Have you ever tried googling yourself or someone from your family and see some unexpected details or personal information come up in public listing sites? Aura can identify data brokers as posing your info and submit opt-out requests on your behalf. Brokers are legally required to remove your info if you ask them to, but they make it super hard to do. Let Aura handle it for you. One feature I find really interesting is how Aura can monitor the dark web for you and check, like it happened in my case, if some of your critical data come up for sale. This is something potentially very, very dangerous that you have basically no individual defense against. So you can try Aura for free for two weeks using my link. And in this way, you will support the channel and please support the people who support me. Moreover, Aura is also a good value overall because it is an integrated sheet that can replace several different packages. You don't have to download several different apps to get things like parental control, antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft, insurance and more. The setup is easy and you get everything at one affordable price. So, you can either let people continue to exploit and profit off your private information, or you can go to https aura.com millennium to start your two week free trial. It is also linked below in the description. And back to the Eurofighter now. 
The interesting element is that normally when it comes to military stuff that has some relevance, the entire supply chain must be certified. Every actor at every level of the supply chain is not exactly free to choose the best supplier according to best economic convenience, but they must choose a supplier that has some requisites in terms of reliability, security, financial structure, and so on. And obviously the nationality of the supplier plays a very important role. Now I need a coffee, but before I want to stress that defense firms compete with each other also with their supply chain because as we have seen it's a fundamental element in composing the overall offering and the overall economic convenience and say strategic sustainability of a specific offering <laughs> from a strategic point of view countries that have an, an ecosystem that can support uh, various big players in various different industries I mean, it is the defense industry, but it is aircraft, land system, naval, and so on, electronics. So countries that actually have an ecosystem that can support these big players, these system integrators, have a distinct advantage. Mind that till the 50s or the 60s, having a civilian sector would have helped in uh, sustaining even the military ecosystem. Today, the technologies that are being used in the military are more and more detached from the technologies used in civilian life. There is overlap, but the general trend is toward the reduction of the overlap and the segregation of defense industry from the civilian industry. So basically having an ecosystem is even more important in the light of this change. Mm. Now, since the supply chain is so important, then this market situation favors fusion, fusion among different players on the same market. And in fact, in the last decades, we continuously have seen mergers, acquisitions and fusion. This is obviously justified by the increased economic sustainabilities of these bigger players that come being created. Actually, this kind of polarization of the market is often seen as a good thing by the legislators or even by the economists, to be honest. When it comes to costs of development of a military aircraft, there's obviously a lot of R&D. And in general, while the cost connected with the R part, with the research part is normally very high, the contribution of the development part is even higher. The point is that military hardware is usually produced in smaller numbers, so economies of scale are difficult to achieve. Having a good, well-established supply chain is a form of mitigation of this effect because the components of the supply chain may be doing basically other stuff, increasing the numbers in this way, and they could possibly achieve the economies of scale. However, you have to consider that this approach is also tempered by the fact that naturally, and from my point of view, completely legitimately, countries want to privilege their industries. So some components of this supply chain may not be those that are economically optimal. Mind, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, we are talking military, we are talking security, we are talking the strategic positioning of a country, so politics must have a role. You can't just go with the less expensive alternative if it's not satisfactory from the point of view of your security. All of this operates upon the unchallenged assumption that fusion and rationalization are a good thing. And this is true particularly in Europe. And in Europe there is another unchallenged assumption that cooperation among governments is a good thing because the burden of building, procuring and operating a weapon system is shared among different 
countries and as we mentioned before more countries larger numbers there is an empirical rule that says that if you decuplicate the production of anything decently complex then the unit cost may go down by 40 percent is a rule of thumb but gives you the idea behind this line of thinking by the way there is another element that favors big numbers which is basically that repetition makes you good this has been seen in weapon systems that have been produced for a relatively long time for example for the Eurofighter it takes 15 to 20 percent less man hours to build an aircraft today because we're still building it so all of this seems logical it's common knowledge everybody knows and as I often say when there is something which is common knowledge when there is something that everybody knows there are good chances that it is not exactly true and in fact with the multinational program or in general with any program where you have multiple important stakeholders either national or private either governments or industries you have increased complexity that you have to manage you have bureaucratic entanglement and you have a hefty dose of stakeholders management they didn't have anything smaller. There are already issues in multinational programs, but maybe the most relevant point is that everybody is actually trying to advance its own national interest through the international programs. This is another reason why the economic solution is not going to be optimal, but from my point of view is rightly so. We are talking about national security. It is not well known, but there do exist an empirical formula that calculates the difference in cost and time between an international program and the same program executed nationally. As you could imagine, it has originated from France and it's called the Delpeche formula. So the more you add countries, the more the cost goes up, albeit there is a sort of diminishing return due to the square root. For the time that it takes to build the object, the same applies, but it is the cubic root rather than the square root. That is, time is a bit less affected than cost by adding countries to a program and if you ask me this flies in the face of what we just said is the conventional unchallenged wisdom so if we consider the typhoon as an example obviously it costed more than it would have costed if it was developed by just a single country it took much longer because yeah we know all the politics that went along with the building of this aircraft was the burden shared yes up to a point but the cost went up and the time went up I suppose that among those political decisions there was the decision to split all the work about the typhoon according to percentages and the split went down to the single subsystem level so both level one and level two contractors had to enter in an agreement with other countries contractors to buy parts of the systems and not every country had the experience or the technology to build a part or a section of the aircraft now as we said before this is economically not optimal but you may argue that in this way the technology actually spread among the typhoon partners and is sort of promoted a more even filled but in general could also promote at a later time much more competition compare this with what has happened with the f-35 yes the f-35 is program that is basically american traction program but there are several international suppliers that are very very important particularly british but also in other countries however in this case the aircraft has been built to be unclassified to the assembly line so it could be assembled pretty much everywhere without giving away all those technologies that make the aircraft particularly effective 
For example, in Italy we have the European assembly line for the F-35 in Camry, the so-called FACO, which, well, okay, it's good, I suppose, is better than nothing, but there's been pretty much zero technology transfer on the technologies that are really important, on the technologies that make the F-35 the aircraft that it is. So, what was more beneficial for Italy, the Eurofighter or the F-35? I leave the answer to you. So, an example of how a multinational program can be less efficient than a national one is the following. In 1995, during the development of the aircraft, there was a plan for 585 meetings among all the four participants. These meetings would include representatives from the companies, representatives from the military, and representatives from the government. Then it turned out that at the end of the year, the meetings had been 796, and the number of participants was up to 60 people. Considering that 1995 was well before the modern teleconferencing technology, yeah, that's an example of where the money is going. With unlimited drinks and snacks, please upgrade your ticket in our club lounge. So, I'm finally home in the UK, and what is the conclusion of this sort of rambling video? Well, there is this unchallenged assumption that multinational cooperation is always good. Well, we have seen that while it is still attractive for some aspects, there are several drawbacks, including cost, complexity, time, and the fact that at the end of the day, even in multinational cooperation, everyone tries to develop, to foster, to help uh, their own industry and to further their own interests. And if you consider all these aspects, maybe national programs become attractive again. However, there's probably one final aspect that is worth mentioning. Multinational programs could be a good way to diffuse and develop technologies among friendly countries. And with this perspective, maybe international programs should be more common. But this is probably asking too much. Anyway, thank you very much for watching this rambling video and see you next time.